a panel earlier at 1 o'clock uh, where we started with a little history and we dealt with the revolution, the Haitian Revolution, and also the, uh, the revolt of 1811. And um, we're moving on to uh, looking at immigration now because we sort of stopped with the uh, mass migrations that were uh, coming into um, into Louisiana after the revolution. Well, Greg uh, Osborne actually talked about uh, the, the migration and the uh, influences of Haiti on colonial Louisiana. Um, but before we get started, I certainly want to recognize our sponsors, uh, the Green Family Foundation, as well as the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. Um, they uh, sponsor this particular, well, the panels uh, that will be held in this tent. We're doing this in order to um, really let you know how strong the historical and cultural connections are with Haiti. Just really happy to know that they're being featured this year. Actually, Haiti was featured some years ago at the Jazz and Heritage Festival. Uh, but we're more than happy this year because, of course, of the devastation that has happened there. So anytime we can have to showcase the artists and um, people from Haiti, we'll uh, take that chance to do so. Now we're going to um, introduce our panelists. Um, this is the panel on looking at the immigration um, and families, uh, ancestral families that have been here for quite some time that have Haitian ancestry. Uh, the first person to my left is um, Mr. Carl Bologna, and Bologna has family has a um, long history of funeral business, and uh, he's gonna talk about uh, his family here. And the next person is Mr. Wayne Bake, and all of you who are from New Orleans, I'm sure you probably know him, or if you don't, you've certainly probably eaten in one of his establishments. Um, of course, his family is uh, has a, the food industry uh, here, and he's had, I, I think he told me about 12 restaurants in the last, how many years, 40? 38, last 38 years, he's uh, had about 12 restaurants. And so right now, he's the owner of Lil Dizzy's on Esplanade. So if you haven't eaten there before, you might wanna uh, check them out, the food is wonderful. And last um, person on the, the list here is uh, Ori Champier, and uh, he, his family doesn't have a long history in Louisiana, but I wanted him to come to talk about what drew him here and how his art has been influenced by that Louisiana uh, Haiti connection. And so he's going to do that for us. So we're going to start with uh, Mr. Bologna, and basically the format will be just for them to talk a bit about the history of their families' um, uh, uh, stay in here in uh, Louisiana, and afterwards, you know, we'll just open it up and uh, have some interaction and question and answers. So, Mr. Bologna? Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Uh, first, I want to thank the Foundation for the invite, uh, and even more so, the people sitting in the audience. You must be crazy, tired, or bored to be sitting down here with all this music and food going around. But we are appreciative and we are glad you're here. Uh, my name is Carl Baloney, and we pronounce it just like Baloney. That's the Americanization of it. Uh, some of my relatives go as Bellany, Balanje, or Bouligny. But my dad, we feel, it made something out of the name Baloney. So. I don't change it when I go to California or anything like that. But uh, I got some relatives, matter of fact, when I call them, uh, the answer machine comes on and it said, hi, you've reached the Bellany residence. And I say, well, hello, Bellany, this is Bologna. <laughs> so that opens the ice. But let me tell you about my family. I'm from St. John Parish. Well, St. John is my home. I moved here the week of Mardi Gras. All right, but St. John has been my home, my family's home. We go back five generations on a plantation known as Boucher, which is San Francisco plantation. My dad moved us, my family, off of the plantation when I was seven years old. We were fortunate some 14 years ago, my wife and I, we bought that plantation, the same plantation that my family moved from. And we were fortunate again Christmas Eve, when Marathon Oil made us an offer we couldn't refuse. So my wife said she had spent the time 
out there with me and she wanted to come back home. But getting back to my family, the Bolognese, the Bellinese, I knew of the Haitian Revolt growing up as a child because we were told our oral history. My grandparents, great-grandparents always told us stories about it. Bits and pieces, mind you. I read nothing of it in the paper, nothing of it in school. I was in college before I really found out that the, the part of the plantation that we refer to as the quarters, like the French Quarter, was actually the slave quarter. I was prohibited from going into the quarter, and I thought because of the construction, all of the, the machinery that was between my grandparents' house and the quarter, that, that prohibited. But it was a different story, and I'll get into that quickly. In uh, growing up on the plantation, uh, I did not realize that we had privileges until I met who is now my wife. Creole girl from New Orleans, see things differently from what I saw. Because you growing up in a community, you're, it was a segregated community. It was even segregated within its own race. I mean, most of the people my color went to the Catholic, the Baptist church, and the people Wayne's color, and Wayne and I have known each other all our lives, went to the Catholic church. Okay, but when my wife started dating me, she noticed out there that there seemed to have been some pecking order. And I said, you must be crazy. I, maybe because my dad was in business, maybe. Because, you know, back then at that time, if you were a preacher, a teacher, or undertaker, these were the people of status in the black community. So I attributed to my dad being in business. But what surfaced as far as her noticing that was when we bought the plantation. A friend of mine, first of all, a story was being done on it of, of us having lived there and then being bought, buying it. And in that research, one of my cousins sent me uh, a, a birth record out of the Bible of my great-great-grandmother. And it stated that she was the daughter of Mr. Bougie. Bougie was the owner of the plantation. Uh, now one thing was somewhat humorous in my family is that uh, I pride myself on my heritage, my, my African Haitian heritage. My dad people are tall, black people, structured face, and very easily I can pick out my people or somebody related to me, I feel very easily. But when my cousin sent that, that document showing that we had been infiltrated, uh, showing that my great-great-grandmother was the daughter of Mr. Bougie, but it also let me know that the privileges we had on the plantation was as a result of that. Now, I knew nothing of that while growing up. I knew nothing of that while even being in college. I only started discovering it when I started looking into it and really searching my mind's eye as far as some of the privileges we've had, be it my dad was the only male, only man on the plantation other than his children who have gone to high, finished high school and gone to college. He was able to finish college, finish high school because his brothers took up the labor. My grandfather was the night watchman on the plantation. Very fair complexion person. All of my uncles worked in the sugar mill. Only one worked in the field and that was his choice. But there were privileges that they had on the plantation. Um, some of the things in reflecting back on the life on the plantation is that uh, you can only, now here in Louisiana we didn't do sharecropping, so there was no planting your, your crops and giving part to the owner. Here and on our plantation, the plantation where I grew up, you were given after the end of the grinding season, the sugarcane season, you were given a in row, an in row of the field. And what the end row is, that it is the last row near the ditch. It's a useless row as far as cultivation is concerned because the, the wheels of the tractors or the wheels of the wagon would always slip into the ditch. So the, the, the master gave you that. And he gave it to you, you can plant corn, anything that you wanted to. We used to plant corn and tomatoes and squash, all the indigenous plants from that area. But still in all, you have to give him half of everything you planted. So you also, cultivated, you fertilize the end row of the field during that time of the year. Another thing was that we could only go to school four years, four months out of a year. 
my dad was able to finish high school because his brother took up his slack. They allowed him, he was able to move here with some relatives in New Orleans, and he was then able to complete high school and go on to college. Now that didn't exist during the time that we were growing up. It was mandated that we go to school. Part of the other thing, the memory from the plantation is that uh, my father and grandfather, they were never paid in cash money. I have an uncle who was the one that worked in the field, very ingratiated, very, very grateful for what the white man has done to him. I mean, he loved white folks. And Uncle Raymond, I remember, said that he remembered when Mr. Claude, and I'm not trying to embarrass anyone or insult anyone, I'm just telling you the way it was and how we felt about it. Mr. Claude was a good man. He said, I remember when Mr. Claude made it a rule that he must pay, we will pay us in money. You see, on the plantation, there was a general store. And at that store, the people would go who couldn't sign, they would sign an X, and you would get whatever you needed from that general store, be it dry goods, uh, be it clothing, be it some food. You would sign for it, and at the end of the grinding season, they would deduct the money that they've been holding from you from what you are due to the general store. And I guess you know many of them never paid out their, their debt. But my, my remembrance of that general store is that they were paid in doubloons. The same doubloons y'all be scrambling for at Mardi Gras. And they be throwing them in Demians and them Zulus. That they were paid in doubloons. And each plantation had its own doubloon. Now my uncle remember when Mr. Claude decided he would no longer pay us in doubloons. Now that plantation house that I told you we bought 15 years ago, in it was a safe that had been moved from the sugar mill. That, that safe was part of the administration building. And that safe was now part of my home. I went in that safe one day and like any drawers in a dresser, I pulled out some drawers and behind one of those drawers was a letter from the Department of Agriculture. And it was dated, I think, 1924 when Congress mandated that field workers be paid in cash. So there went out the window, Mr. Claude's goodwill of paying folks in, uh, in cash rather than the balloon. But uh, that was the time and that was the issue. Uh, my connection to the, 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 the Haitian is that St. John is a, was a French-speaking parish, was a parish where we grew sugarcane. So it made good sense for them to bring Haitian slaves to that area to work the field. Now, the Haitians were very unruly slaves. I mean, the, 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 the owners really lived very tense moments every day of the year under the Haitian slaves. Uh, one of the reasons that they built these mansions on St. Charles Avenue was that after the grinding season, they would escape and come down to New Orleans uh, leaving their, their, their headmasters uh, in charge of the slave while they get some rest and break away from it. But what happened, my grandparents would tell us about the slave revolt, and even though you come out there, you'll see Marcus saying that that revolt started in what's known as the Plas. We were told it started on our plantation, on Bougier plantation. We were told that during the times when the plots were being made for the slave revolt, they would have, they were only allowed camp meetings, which was Sunday church. They didn't have buildings. They would have camp meetings under the trees with logs and fire burning. And we always knew that there were some spies or people who would report back to the master as what was going on. So within it, they had their own signals and ways of knowing who was probably the, the snitch or the one that was going to go back and tell. And some of the things that evolved from that, that we even use now in the Baptist churches, uh, they have a saying that uh, while we, are, and I put myself in that position, is that while they may have been discussing the, the, the plot about the slave revolt, if someone who they felt would go back and tell a master was coming, they would start humming. Remember, they're supposed to be having camp meetings, they're supposed to be having church, so it's not unusual for them to be singing a song or thing, but they would hum or, uh, or hum some song. Mm, I love the Lord. Mm -hmm. And what they say that in the, in the Baptist church, we have a saying, when you're humming, the devil don't know what you're talking about. And part of that came from the plotting, the methods they used when someone would come that they would go back and tell. 
Another thing about the revolt is that we were told that when the revolt did take place, they had been planning for years on that because you see, what the plantations used to do, the smaller plantations would hire out hands from the larger plantation. So that was our chain of communication of getting the word around. And when the time did come for the revolt to take place, uh, they planned to commandeer a ship in Carrollton, which was the part of the city then, uh, which was larger than New Orleans, and to go back to Africa. And at that time, the governor name was C.C. Claiborne. And C.C. Claiborne declared when that revolt took place, St. John being under the, 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 the Spanish rule, uh, civil code rather, uh, compared to other states where they have counties, we have parishes. St. John Parish, we used to have, rather than councilmen or aldermen, we used to have what was known as police jurors, police jurymen. C.C. Claiborne, and where that came from, C.C. Claiborne, when that revolt broke out, declared every white man a police juror. He could catch you, pass sentence on you at that time. And that was what helped to squash that slave revolt. And after that revolt, and this is what was told to me by my ancestors, after that slave revolt, the slaves who were not killed on the spot was brought back. And many of my relatives was in there. One of the leaders' name was very similar to Baloney. I think it was Bellamy, all right? Because after the revolt, many of my people changed their names completely. But after that revolt and after the capture of these slaves, they were brought back to St. John and they were decapitated. Their heads were cut off and they were placed on stakes along the river from one end of St. John Parish to the other end of St. John Parish. And it was as a reminder. Now, now, it was like the jazz fest. People came from far and near to see this site. And they were left up there until they were eaten by the, by the animals, by the birds, and by the insects. They were placed from one end of the parish to the other. My parents tell me, uh, I got an uncle now who don't eat certain nuts. These little hazelnuts, you don't eat these hazelnuts because they associated them with decapitated parts off of the slaves. They refer to them as nigger toes. And this is something that he's grown up with, maybe not even knowing why he feel that way about it, but I'm sure it's through the oral history, which is either lost, stolen, or forgotten. But in St. John, we, we're embedded with, with history of our Haitian ancestors. Uh, Wayne and I sat briefly, and Wayne said, he pulled out a, a scroll of his family tree. Uh, and he said, we come from France by way of Haiti. And I said, how did they get in France? And he said, oh, you got to ask them that. And the answer to that is that same trip, different ship. Thank you very much. I don't know nearly as much about my history as Cole does about his. Uh, but it is a, it comes from a slightly different venue. We talk about France, and I'm not sure of the history, except that Hades, the French decided that to take over Haiti. That's what happened. Uh, and unfortunately, one of those people, obviously, was one of my ancestors. Okay? Now, I have a, a family tree thing that I've been working on for years. And what happened was, in, in that generation, um, this particular person who is, I gotta look at my card, John P. Baquet, it was B-A-C-Q-U-I-E at the time, which also made it very difficult to trace my roots because it's B-A-Q-U-E-T now. And it was, it went from B-A-C-Q-U-I-E to B-A-Q-U-I-E. To make a long story short on that, uh, John, when he went to, from, came from France, he married a lady named Juana. That's all I know is Juana, J-U-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. And their trip to France, they had a child called Jean Baptista Bernard Baquet. 
1790, St. Domingos, Haiti, which is Haiti. And when he grew up, he married Fanny F. Cotterock, C-H-O-U-D-R-A-C, from Haiti, an inhabitant of Haiti. So as I, Carl and I was talking about it earlier, that's where the African Association came in, I think, in my family. Can't attest to that, but I'm, uh, I think that's where it came from. And then from there, they had the uprising. And when the uprising happened, the French people and the free people of color had to get out of Haiti right away, or they were gonna be killed. That's the way that went down. And my folks moved to Cuba, and um, became a part of the Cuban uh, community for a while, and I don't know why. I do know they took up cigar making, was one of the main uh, trades that they had, but they decided from Cuba, a short period in Cuba, like 10, 12 years, I'm not sure, to come to New Orleans. And I could, uh, I have a record of Jean Baptiste Martillo Baquet, who is the son of Fanny F. and Jean Baptista, and he married Marie Adele Russo, and she was born in Canada. Now, how all that came about, I don't know. A lot of people were moving around New Orleans back then. It must be said, too, that a couple of hundred years ago, the major inhabitants of New Orleans was Africans and free people of color. And if you know the history, we're talking about it. The place that we inhabited, built, established, and did everything in was Treme, which I am and my family comes from Treme. We lived in Treme all our lives, and, we're, and I still have a business in Treme. But rather than go on, just to let you know, I'm trying to stick with the Haitian connection. Uh, they had a son named Théogène Baquet. I'm going to give you a little bit of the history. Now, Théogène Baquet, and this was not uncommon, he was uh, um, a famed musician who could write music, and which was very unusual, who also had two families simultaneously, which was not unusual at the time. And I'm talking about only a few blocks away. Okay? So he had one family, which was George Baquet, who's a famous jazz musician, one of the originators of jazz, teacher of Sidney Beche, Aishio Baquet, Ada Baquet, and Alma Baquet. And as he was married to a lady named uh, Leo Cadet Martinez, and Leo Cadet as, uh, I don't know why, I guess you just have to assume this, they guess she was getting old and whatever. That's the way these cats operated back then. And he married a younger woman who was like 20 years younger than him. And her name was Josephine Belton. And that's my great, great grandmother. So with Josephine Belton, he had like seven children, starting with the oldest uh, being Charles Richard Baquet, who was my grandfather. And uh, Charles Richard, and Ada, I think it's Ada, are the same age. Strangely enough, these people didn't know that they were related until my father, uh, Edward Bakke, uh, who used to do odd jobs for different people, went on and did some work for Ada Bakke Gross. When he told her who he was, she understood. And she took him, he, he under her wing, and he went on, got married, and by the same token, she sponsored her husband in a restaurant called Paul Gross Chicken Coop, which unfortunately a lot of people don't remember, but this is a great part of history because Paul Gross Chicken Coop was one of the first African-American restaurants in New Orleans. It was open 24 hours. Paul, you probably remember that. You're old enough. <laughs> uh, but Ada, sponsored uh, Paul Gross in a restaurant. A lot of people don't know that. She was the brain, she was smart. She also was the one with the money, okay? In fact, Paul Gross could not read or write. My dad 
taught him how to read and write with our help, me and my older brother, Ed, Eddie Bakke. And that was pain, very painful. Uh, but just to, just to give you a little bit of history, that's how we got started in the restaurant business with my dad working for Paul Gross and Ada Bakke Gross. And uh, then he went on to open up Eddie's Restaurant, which, is, which became kind of famous, 2119 Law Street, and then uh, my brothers, my brothers in the audience, my sister-in-law's in the audience. And then from there, you know, we went on to open up several restaurants and to kind of like make a name for ourselves in the restaurant business. But going back to it, the two families that happened simultaneously and something else that happened quite often back then is George and Ashia were both considered to be master jasmine. George stayed with his people, stayed with his roots, stayed with his African roots, you know, became very famous, played with all the famous musicians. Louis Armstrong was actually an understudy to him, uh, as Sidney Bechet was. Ashio uh, met and married a girl from another part of Louisiana and moved to California and, uh, as the old saying goes, became a Passa Blanc. Passa Blanc means he passed for white. And his family coming down through the years, they, you know, I met them after years. It's, it's, uh, it, it's people, they, they want to be a part of the Creole culture now because they understand the African roots. It also must be said that if you, uh, we, we live in such a strange place in New Orleans, which is kind of caught in the middle of such a strange state, Louisiana. I mean, you know, uh, I don't want to make anybody mad, but New Orleans is the greatest place in the world, and it's sitting right in the middle of the most racist state in the United States. And that's a problem, because that's, we always have a problem with New Orleans versus the rest of the state. They don't understand, everybody don't understand, it's all about New Orleans. In fact, let's just say one last thing, the only form, art form to ever come out of this country is jazz, and it came right from New Orleans. And uh, that's my story. I thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Champier. Um, of course, needless to you to say that I'm originally from Haiti. And I just want you to take you this opportunity you know, to thank all of you and especially George Jackson, you know, for inviting us you know, to this you know, panel and discussion. And it is a great thing you know, to see that after two approximately your know, two hundred and nineteen years of history that uh, we come to the point where that we can gather on this, you know, common ground, you know, to recognize, you know, to, and acknowledge uh, our connection, you know, with Haiti. You know, um, for, let's say, over 200 years, it's been over 200 years, this country, I mean, when it's come to Haiti, Haiti has contributed so much, not only you know, to Louisiana, but you know, to different countries in the Americas, but Haiti is very seldom got the recognition that it deserves because what happened, Haiti has been um, polit politically overshadowed by politics because of its significance. So, but I have here to say, no matter what happened, we cannot change because of history. And as an artist, I'm proud to be here today and to see that finally there's something being done to recognize you know, the historical and cultural connection that Haiti has uh, with Louisiana. Uh, when it comes to Haiti's genetic you know, culture, it is began in the late uh, 1490s when African native 
the native people um, were enslaved in Haiti and they took refuge in the mountains of Haiti and where the African and the Indians, they share the culture, they exchange the culture. And that culture is still evident in our artistic creativity in Haiti today. And I have yet to say that, you know, when it comes to the Haitian culture that was formed in the mountains of Haiti during the time of colonization, from 1493 to 1789, 1791, you can see that uh, the Maoons, you know, culture, it's become you know, the source uh, for artists of various discipline in our culture, whether if you are a poet or musician, painter, um, whether if you are a dancer, and of course, the Haitian genetic culture is really the central part of our inspiration. But of course, you know, oftentimes we do not make you know, that statement because most of us want to be connected to Europe instead of here to Africa. But Africa, it, it is it's really the motherland of our, of our independence. Because without you, the music, without you, the culture that was, that was uh, reserved by the Indians, by the Africans who took refuge in the mountains you know, to, uh, to protest against slavery. So today we would not have you know, such great you know, rich culture. And I am part of that culture. I mean, it man is the product of his environment. When I was growing up in Haiti, um, as a child, I remember I would wake up in the morning and I would wake up you know, by the sound of the vendors you know, passing offering you food, offering you something to, to sell you. And I would wake up on the sound, by the sound of the whiskers. I would, sound, I would wake up you know, by the sound of people passing, singing a beautiful song. And, and the lyric, lyrics of this song I mean, you would find beauty, hope, and all those things. If you have a sensitive soul, especially artist, you right there you feel you feel generate, generated, you know, by um, a source of inspiration. So, as a young boy, as I was growing up in Haiti, I remember when I was going to school, and I remember that. Learning Haitian history was uh, something that was very important, you know, to us, you know, Haitian. Because when you learn, as you are learning Haitian history, you realize that Haiti, the Haitian people, they have, you know, contributed you know, so much you know, to the world, and you had you know, to recite you know, the history and memorize you know, that history by heart. But of course, you know, as a child, you do not really understand what you are saying, but as you are growing up, and then as the time start making sense to you. And I am one of those you know, kids who, who were learning history but did not know what, it was, what I was really learning until I became older and then I realized, wow, Haiti is a great place, you know, Haiti has contributed so much. And that, you know, history become the subject of my art. So I grew up here to be an artist. And that history, you know, become the subject, you know, the central, you know, point when it comes to the creation of my art on the Haitian history. Uh, in the late 70s, I was, uh, as I was living in Haiti, going to school, so 
I received a letter from the American Embassy here from Jackson University and also the Haitian Cultural a, the Haitian Cultural Society in Philadelphia and Audience America in Philadelphia who sent me a letter you know, to invite me you know, to the United States. But uh, that invitation was in conjunction with the American Bicentennial celebration in, seven, in, in 1976. So I came, I did not come here until 1977, but however, you know, some of my early work of art were uh, exhibited at Drexel University in Philadelphia. So I lived in Philadelphia until 1994. And of course, in 1991, I came to New Orleans for art exhibition uh, during the Black History Month. I had a couple of shows in the Fresh Quarter and also in Alexandria. And at that time, you know, I made some connection with the people and the Haitian community, particularly you know, the professionals, you know, in the in the community who had you know great admiration for my art. And of course, at that point, you know, I met um, Michelle, who is now you know my wife, my and also her sister, Modik, my sister-in-law. And I met your know, father, who was a uh, a great collector of Haitian art. Of course, you know he's a physician, and he has been practicing medicine, you know, in Louisiana for decades. But what happened? Even though he has left Haiti for many years, but his love, you know, for his country and culture was never, you know, uh, diminished. So we became friends, and then we keep, you know. Uh, we stay in communication, so uh, I always had a reason you know, to come back here you know, to Louisiana for different artistic activities. But when I came in 1994, when I came uh, to Louisiana, and I realized, well, this is the place where I want to stay. And when I took a walk in the quarter, and I realized that this place reminds me so much of Haiti, and then I see when it's come to the architecture, when it's come to the music, when it's come to the people. And I realized that there's so much similarities. So, and that's the time you know I became interested, you know, to do research on Haiti, on not only on Louisiana's history, but on the connection between Louisiana and Haiti. And so, the more the more research you know that you know I've done, and I realized that well, it's the more I feel connected you know, to this land. And so that become you know part of the subject you know that you know. Uh, that I have been working on. In fact, you know, now I have been working on a series on uh, on Louisiana's history, connecting uh, connected you know, to Haiti's uh, history. And so, very soon you will see, you know, some of the painting that I create, you know, on the subject when it's come to the length of the two, the length of the two, uh, that's uh, that these two places, you know, share. But when I look at, you know, Haiti's history. In, he, in Haitian culture, not only when I look at, when I do a parallel between Haiti and Louisiana, and I realize that, well, we share about you know, 219 years of history, but the thing is that it seems like, you know, the uh, Haiti and Louisiana uh, consistently showing, um, showing, uh, sharing history, sharing their history, whether if it is your know, tragedy, for example, uh, think about you know Katrina, the experience with Kat with the Katrina and tragedy in Louisiana in 2005. But in in five years later, Haiti has suffered another tragedy as well. And for me, as an artist, I see myself as a dash between the two places because those two places they are special to me. And they both both places, you know, hold a, um, the source of my inspiration. So, but I have yet to say that I am lucky you to be here. Um, even though Katrina has destroyed, you know, many of my artwork in some way um, repairable, and which you know I uh, I'm still repairing now. But now. To see, you know, uh, 
that tragedy, you know, that devastated, you know, Haiti, and after all that time, Haiti is in this situation, and I realized that, well, th things are not any better uh, in Louisiana, because I remember, you know, after Katrina, uh, there were, you know, so many people who have made donations toward the people of Louisiana, and of course, many people did not receive, you know, this donation in, in Haiti, until now, you know, people are still living on the makeshift tent. But I have yet to say that you know, this type of connection and this kind of gathering, it's kind of you know keeping Haiti fresh in the mind of people, and um, and I'm glad you to be here. By the way, you know the work you know, that you are looking over there, these are you know my painting, uh, painting you know, that I have done on Haitian history, and the purpose of those paintings uh, were you know, to celebrate you know, the Haitian bicentennial, which was not celebrated and not only not celebrated, but was not even commemorated. Um, because, of course, you know, politics always get in the way when it's come to celebrating Haiti, Haitian pride. But as an artist, I realized that I have an obligation. The obligation that I have is to keep the hope alive and then to keep the spirit of the people of Haiti alive, you know, to the art you know, that I do. So, Anyway, uh, besides you see, looking at this painting on the on the screen, but this book, Revolutionary Freedom, was a book you know, that was put together to commemorate you know, the Haitian bicentennial. So it continued you know, this painting as well. So it was a book you know, that it, uh, that was done in collaboration with scholars of various disciplines, uh, museum crack, uh, curators, university professors of various disciplines who contribute texts that goes, you know, uh, along with the painting, with these paintings. So, of course, you know, in the book also, there's a section on Louisiana, the connect that, uh, focus on the, on the connection uh, between Louisiana and Haiti, written by Gwendolyn Midlow Hall and John O'Connor, and various, you know, people, you know, contribute, you know, uh, pe people in various disciplines contribute you know, to this book. So, I know you the time is getting short and all, of course, you know, I have good appetite you know, to talk, so, and plus, you know, I see my good friend, Marius Dejan comes, so I do not want to think, you know, all the time, so if you have any questions, okay, so, thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, we have been, um, uh, Ms. Dejan has arrived, so we'll let her talk next before we open it up to question and answer. So talk about your ancestry, too. Testing. I'm really happy to be here this afternoon with you, and I'm so happy to see this uh, happening, taking place right now at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. I think it's very important in the light of what's happened in Haiti in terms of the earthquake. I think it's important uh, because of the link that Haiti and uh, New Orleans have always had. And I hope that it will be the beginning of more encounters such as this as we delve deeper into the history, into the culture, and into uh, the rapport between the two places. I came to New Orleans in 1982. I was always fascinated with New Orleans. First of all, because my father always told me about the connection and the roots there between um, family members. And I know that I have family here in New Orleans who actually went to Haiti. And uh, this was quite a while back. They were the Philippes and the Durand and also a clock, so three family names. Now I have the family name Dejan also, and many people tell me, ask me if I'm related to the Dejans here in Louisiana. And I'd like to say that probably we are distant cousins because all Dejans in this part of the hemisphere um, come from the same source. Two brothers, Dejan, who married two sisters. And uh, in Haiti, uh, the family was separated. Um, some of them stayed in the southern part, and some of them went to the north. 
there's an accent aigu or an acute accent over the first letter, the first E in Deja. And um, I was surprised when I came here in Louisiana and New Orleans to see that people pronounced it as Deja. Um, that, that was amazing to me. It's such a personal encounter for me to be here in New Orleans because right away when I came, I looked in people's faces and I actually recognized the faces of relatives, um, cousins or friends, or family members, family um, connections. And when I started looking at the food, the red beans and rice and the seasonings used in many of the dishes, I felt that connection again. I started uh, researching a little bit about the family connections, and I haven't made great headways, but I think that this is something that is going to continue uh, for me until uh, it will be a perpetual discovery, is what I'm saying. And um, so there is a connection, the family names, uh, um, and also the, the feeling uh, being here, I don't think that I could really live anywhere else after living here in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, when I go elsewhere, uh, I don't find the same, uh, the same type of food and the same joie de vivre that you find here in New Orleans, a celebration of life despite everything and the resilience that there is here in New Orleans. I think that there's the same resilience in Haiti with the Haitian people. And we've both had to, both areas, both places have had to overcome a great deal of tragedy and um, uh, upheavals in history. But I, what makes each place unique, I think, is that each place, if I can use a cliche, really moved to the beat of its own drummer. The music here has also fascinated me, and I've been on a perpetual um, learning uh, experience. And early on, I discovered uh, Sidney Bechet and his association with, you know, the Haitian orchestra. I listened to a lot of the music, um, you know, New Orleans classics, and and the beat. First of all, the beat, and then some of the lyrics. Um, also reminded me of Haiti a lot. What fascinated me even more is the carnival tradition and some of the smaller, the, the social aid and pleasure clubs here. And then when I saw the skeletons for the first time, believe it or not, it was just a few years back, and I thought, oh my goodness, that really pulled me back into Haitian carnival traditions which I remember since I was three years old, you know, going out in town. Um, in Haiti, Carnival is a, more of a, a, a citywide happening. There's not that separation, you know, where you have um, the, the floats going down the street and then people standing, you know, on each side, so to speak. It's more, you know, like, uh, it's more like Brazil, uh, where everything is just um, all together something that happens in uh, en masse, if I can say. So those are all my connections with, uh, with New Orleans. Uh, it, it's, it's been a process of remembering everything that I saw growing up in Haiti. And it wasn't that long because I left Haiti when I was three years old. My family had to go into exile. And then we went to West Africa. And in West Africa, I also had discoveries because a lot of uh, words, a lot of um, uh, dancing, dance steps, reminded me of things in Haiti. And I found those same things here in New Orleans. I was astounded when I went to a photography exhibit and I saw a photo done by Keith, uh, Cal uh, Keith, uh, um, Keith, yes. Um, he had a photograph and it's called Maasai. And I saw um, all these, uh, these men, you know, caught in mid-air, you know, jumping up like that and just caught in mid-air and almost in a trance-like state. 
So my experience with New Orleans, with Africa, with Haiti is always comes back to New Orleans and how much New Orleans is um, retains a lot of these traditions and I recognize them every day and, and every celebration and the second line traditions. Um, I found my first brass band in Haiti while I was in Al Qaeda, the village where I was born, and I saw and I thought, oh my gosh, this is a brass band. And um, remember, I didn't grow up in Haiti, so I saw them all, you know, even with the caps, the, the same type of caps and, uh, you know, in suits, and um, they were marching along the road. I don't know where all of this is, what this is going to lead to, whether to some type of series of essays or a book when I finally get to make the connections and um, to, to actually write our family's history, which branches out uh, extensively throughout uh, New Orleans uh, and now in Africa as well. But uh, this is something that I'm truly looking forward to and each day that I'm here in New Orleans it's a constant discovery for me and I know that um, we are deeply linked and um, that really the culture is the thread in the whole tapestry that that we're, we're constantly weaving together and to me there is really no separation and I think that this is why it's so important that um, we preserve New Orleans culture and that we preserve Haiti's culture, that we make every effort possible to keep the history alive and to keep those traditions alive and that we work so that history is not rewritten, but that um, you know the truth can be made known. And up to today, I'm amazed at how many people don't really know about Haiti and the connections between Haiti and New Orleans and the whole issue of the Louisiana Purchase. So there's much work to be done. And I think that as long as we explore it through culture, through our culture, through our music, and that we remember the link uh, that we have with each other, you know, people to people, um, that will be the way to perpetuate the history, to share that, and also to celebrate who we are, because we really are a gumbo, all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few minutes, so we can take a couple of questions, if anybody has burning questions that they might want to ask one of the panelists on their family history. Wayne. This is this is from uh, Wayne Bakke. I, I just wondered, Wayne, how far back do you have to go in your family before you find somebody that speaks Creole or Louisiana French? Speak Creole. My grandmother, my grandmother spoke Creole, and uh, the family that we had that lived in Point La Hache, they spoke Creole. They couldn't even speak English. Uh, and my grandma, my mother understood it. So whenever they wanted to say things that they didn't want us kids to hear, my grandmother would speak it to my mother and she would just respond, yeah, you know, like that. And so it's just uh, two generations old. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, if not, thank you for coming. And I want to remind you that our next panel is at 4.30. And that will be John Hankins, Nick Spitzer, and Jay Edwards talking about Haitian influence on New Orleans architecture. And uh, just want to invite you to also enjoy. Uh, hello? <laughs> is it? Hello, uh, to join us tomorrow as well as Sunday, because uh, each day we'll have three panels right here dealing with those cultural and historical connections between Haiti and New Orleans. So thank you very much for coming.